why does everyone talk about the Christmas in Luke? This time we're going to talk about it for real in Luke 2. Okay, so last week I promised we would find out why everyone loves the story of Christmas in Luke. But you know what? It was actually in Luke 2. And this is why everyone loves it. It is so well written. And hopefully you had a chance to read this. You've read it before. But it is so warm. Matthew's is very detailed. Again, Matthew is about prophecy being fulfilled from the Jewish people, explaining it to Jewish people why Jesus is the fulfillment of everything they saw. Luke, again, parallels most of what Mark says, except has some add-ons. So you imagine that Luke is very educated, knows Greek at a very high level, and It says that he went and gathered information. He interviewed people to understand what was going on. So, of course, with Mark being probably written down at this point, he had a starting point. He's like, I have the book of Mark. There's no real reason to reinvent the wheel. So that one is clearly the basis of what Luke writes about. But there's more to it. So you could tell he interviewed other people. Some of those people clearly seem to be women, the women who are involved in the life of Jesus. And because he's such a wonderful writer, and Mark was trying to be immediate, quick, action-packed, Jesus, the man of action, Luke is trying to tell this full story of what Jesus did here on earth. And he's going to say that this is a man who's going to redeem us all. So his message is going to be about freedom release from the debt of sin, and the kingdom of heaven, which is going to be for everybody. And so that's what we get. When we start off here in Luke 2, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was common. There were other places that recorded that they had such a survey of people, and it mentions the governor and other people who are well known in that time. So Joseph had to leave Galilee, leave Nazareth, and go to his hometown, which was Bethlehem. Mary is somewhat pregnant. Maybe they were relieved to get out of town, because you can bet the stories of what happened were running through a small town like Nazareth. But Bethlehem, it's probably nice, and he probably has relatives, and so he goes there. And this is very quick. There's no magi, no stories like that. She wrapped him in swaddling linen, essentially strips of linen prepared for a baby and laid him in a manger, which is a trough for feeding animals. Again, it says there were no places at the inn, probably because a lot of people were traveling to Bethlehem. But this was likely in a cave, a carved out cave, or other places that I saw that were animal areas were stone buildings that were attached to the house. So it wasn't like they threw him literally in the barn. This was probably nice. It was enclosed. And they were probably grateful to have a roof over their head. People, again, in history, when if you go there, will say it is a particular cave. Caves were a safe place to keep animals and, you know, make sure they stay in the cave. But it was a place, right? But this is why everybody loves the story of Christmas from the point of Luke. Because we talk about the angels and the shepherds in the field. And it says the shepherds were out in the field. They're keeping watch over their flock by night. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them. And in the glory of the Lord shone around them. So this is going to be this bright light. And they were afraid. We saw in the past Gospels when Jesus transfigured and had the glory of the Lord, it flattened the apostles to the ground. So this is obviously a very scary thing. These are humble people. They probably have very little education, but they're skilled. This is an important skills trade. And commentary suggested that these were probably temple shepherds, that they were hired to keep track of the lambs and the animals that are going to be sacrificed at the temple. They don't have the best reputation. Think about it in terms of family farms, right? You have a family and they have children and they run the farm and their children, like David, are going to be the shepherds and there are going to be some hired shepherds in that area. But being a shepherd was a good way of being out of town of not being in the center of things. And so sometimes it said that they, uh, you know, I think borrowed each other's sheep, which I think means that they took each other's animals and they weren't necessarily a very reliable group of people. Again, 
Jesus' upside-down kingdom, his reverse of everything that everyone expected, the Lord would, of course, show himself to kings, right? He would present himself to the higher educated scribes of the world. And instead, he's not just going to the lowly, but he's going to people with bad reputations. And the angel says, fear not. See, angels always tell you not to be afraid. For behold, I bring you good news. There's that gospel word of great joy. Luke is filled with joy. That will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, Bethlehem, a Savior who is Christ, the Lord. We know from the onset, this is the Messiah. This is Christ the Lord. And he says, this will be a sign for you. You'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloth, lying in a manger. And suddenly, the angel surrounded by a heavenly host, praising God. Host is a whole bunch. It basically is an army of angels. And what are those angels saying? Glory to God in the highest, peace on earth and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. Everyone, this is meant for everybody and we should be at peace because we understand God's will for us. And then the angels went away from them, went back into heaven and the shepherd said to them, whoa, well, they didn't say that in the Bible, but let's go to Bethlehem and see what happened which the Lord has made known to us. And so they ran off. They found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. And it says that when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them about the child. They told Mary and Joseph and that everyone who heard it was at wonder. Mary, it says, treasured all of these things, pondering them in her heart. I mean, she must have been overwhelmed. To have this happen to you when you're a virgin, a young girl, unmarried, Joseph sticks by you. Then there's Joseph who gets this vision. He must be nervous. Did I do the right thing? Did I hallucinate any of this? You know, I wonder if at any point they questioned anything. They must have just been getting it in the rumor mills inside of Nazareth. And now to have this justification, this second message that, hey, the shepherds know what's happening. And they started glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard as it been told to them. Boy. And then at the end of eight days, he was circumcised, which was customary in Judaism. And they named him Jesus, the name that the angels told him before he was conceived in the womb. This was going to be his name. Wow. Isn't it beautiful? Can't you just see the night? Every ounce of that night and the shepherds, and the host of angels hazing. And what I like about the story is it continues that idea. Again, it seemed like with Matthew or the other Gospels, this was very small group of people. We started out with a very small group of people who knew what was coming. But then in the beginning of Luke, we saw it was Zachariah, Elizabeth, and going to be their baby, John the Baptist. And everyone who heard it from then, the word went out from them. Now our group is bigger. Now it's the shepherds and the people who heard the shepherds. This anticipation of the Lord is getting to be a bigger group. This is not Jesus, Mary, and Joseph against the world. Not that it would be anyway. It's for the world. But this is a growing community of people who knew Jesus was the Lord. And bringing this baby in in the city of David, Bethlehem, which means house of bread. It also translates to house of war because what I was told when I was in Israel is war and bread often go hand in hand. It brings fulfillment to the prophecies too. And anyone with a sense of what a Messiah would be would understand these messages of peace, of welling things up in your heart, goodwill towards men, and like I said, they would have known the gospel. The word gospel was used all the time when a new Caesar was born or Caesar had arisen to the part of emperor. Everything good would have been good tidings. So the word would have been understood by everybody. In this case, it means something very special just happened. And the Gentiles listening to this, who were probably just brand new baby Christians, would have gotten it. And again, Jesus means 
the Lord saves. The name is perfect, and they did exactly what they were told to do. Even people in the lowliest position, the shepherds in the field, probably kind of dirty and smelly. They probably were not the cleanest people in the world back in those days. And again, this is a sight that we're going to talk to everybody. So at a certain point, Jesus is brought to the temple that's going to be in Jerusalem that is meant for purification. And so that is for the child and it's for Mary. And usually a sacrifice is brought. And this is where it's kind of interesting because it says a pair of turtle doves were brought, which indicates to most people the Magi had not yet visited them at this point because had they had the wealth that the Magi's brought them, the frankincense, gold, and myrrh, they would have brought a lamb. A pair of turtle doves, young pigeons, were what poor people brought as a sacrifice. They were very low priced. And while they were doing this, a man named Simeon comes up to them. Our community is growing bigger already. And it said that he was righteous and devout. He was waiting for, quote, the consolation of Israel. This is ESV. But he had the Holy Spirit about him. Mentioned the last time that At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is dispersed to all believers, and we have him all the time. At that time, the Holy Spirit came upon people, and then it was revealed to him, it said, that he would not see death. He's not going to die until he sees the Lord's Christ, the Lord's Messiah. And he held Jesus in his arms, and he said a poem or a song. It's hard to tell if it was sung or said, but Lord... You now are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all people, and a light of revelation for all Gentiles and for the glory of your people Israel. This is going to be for everyone, Gentiles and your people of Israel. And he basically says he's going to see the Lord's Messiah, the Lord's Christ before he dies, and he just did. So when he sees him in the court, he knows immediately what it is he is seeing. This was also put together as a song. The Latin hymn is called Nunc Dimittis because of the opening words of the hymn. And it says that this is sung today in many liturgies already. Basically, it's saying, I've done it. You promised me I would see this before I died. And now I have with my very own eyes, in my own arms, I have seen the Savior. And it says that, The father and the mother, Joseph and Mary, were marveled about what they said. And then Simeon blessed them. And to his mother, this is really weird. And I don't know what you would take. Again, Mary, a very young girl. Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel. You know, some people are going to rise up. We're going to see that in the apostles. Many people are going to fall because of the words of Jesus. For a sign that is opposed, people are going to oppose this. and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. So Mary's heart is going to be pierced in this process too. This is not Jesus only who's going to be pierced. And I guess, how can you deny that? To watch your son being crucified, her heart is going to be pierced. When she sees the life go out of him, she has that same hope that she had for longer than anybody. Then I think if I were Joseph, I'd be like, well, what about me? Is my heart not going to be pierced? Joseph's not around, so he never gets to that point. So then Simeon blesses them and his mother, and then the prophet Anna comes. She is the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher, so she's one of the original tribes of Israel. She was in advanced years. Remember, we're not going to call women old because we know better. Only angels don't know better. Luke. He knows better, fans years. And now she's a widow of 84 years old. She was fasting and praying by night. And at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God. And speaking of him to all, it says, all those that are waiting in Jerusalem for redemption. So we have two older people and her being a prophetess. What does a prophetess mean? When we see prophets in the Bible, and we'll talk about this more when we get to other prophets, It means that they are a messenger of God. It doesn't necessarily mean like we tend to think of it as telling the future. It could be telling someone what they did. It could be telling someone, if you keep on this path, these are the ramifications you're going to face. 
it's more complicated than than just saying a prophet tells the future. That's how we look at it now. So she had the message of God in her when she came and spoke. And think of it this way, with her being elderly, at any point in her life, she could have lost hope in the coming Messiah, but she never did. And now she knew, even now, I see him. To have that much faith all the way through your life, to know that you are going to see the redemption of Jerusalem at hand. After the dedication, but before they went back to Nazareth, they would have been visited by the Magi in that particular case. And it says the child grew and became strong and full of wisdom. So now we're going over to Jerusalem for the Feast of Passover. You know, we don't see the temple much in the other Gospels. But someone pointed out, we start with Zechariah in the temple. We now are in the temple again because of Passover. And we know that at the end of this story, we're going to be back in the temple area at Passover. Parents goes every year to Passover. He's 12 years old right now. And it says, according to the custom, at this point, a son would be bar mitzvahed. But this is in line with that tradition. So they were returning behind. And it says Jesus just stays. And the parents didn't know. So who knows how far down the road they get. And part of the reason why people feel like this is not some sort of horrible shadow on his parents is usually you went in groups. When you came time for the census, Joseph and Mary probably traveled in groups of people. And when people go into Jerusalem for Passover, also traveling in big groups of family members, friends. And so you would have all the kids kind of hanging out together, walking, just like all the kids at Thanksgiving at the kids table. Instead of the table, they'd be walking together. And when they realize he's not there, they go back looking for him. And it says that after three days, well, there's that three days, right? Jesus is going to be in the earth for three days. He's missing for three days. Three days is that symbolism coming back again. And the teachers were listening to him and asking him questions. And it says that everyone who heard him was amazed by his answers. And the parents were like, dude, where were you? You have treated us badly. Your father and I have been looking. It says we're in great distress. So he says, well, didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? So then they all went back to Nazareth and he was submissive to his parents. So he didn't mouth at them. He didn't say, hey, dude, I'm the Lord. I get to do what I want. I had to be in my temple. Instead, he did the thing he was supposed to do. But it says again, his mother treasured up these things in her heart. And Jesus continued to grow, quote, in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. So Mary understands, and I'm sure Joseph does too, that what is happening is bigger than the both of them together, that this is a big deal, and that Mary and Joseph would have gone regularly, Luke says it was regularly, to Jerusalem for the annual Passover feast. So they were one of the many crowds of people who go to Jerusalem for that because it is the most important festival day and a tradition that has been going on since the exodus of Moses leaving Egypt. This was the first tradition out there for Jewish people. It's funny, one of the commentaries said that this was partially for the education of Jesus. But when I read it again, I thought, was it for his education? It did say that he was sitting among the teachers and listening to them and asking them questions. But it also says all that heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. So who was getting an education there? I think everybody was. So that ends Luke 2. What I'm going to meditate on are these two older people, Simeon and Anna, who waited their whole life. Simeon, who was promised that he was going to see the Messiah, and Anna, who spoke for God. In some way, she was a messenger of God. And both of them recognized that even in their advanced years, we're talking about the redemption of Jerusalem. We're talking about the fulfillment of the Messiah, the Christ is here with us. And that Mary's soul is going to be pierced also. That they stood steadfast. They must have seen good times, bad times, but they knew this one day was going to come. And did they have doubts? Did they give up? Did they just wash their hands of it? They waited. That's great. 
What I'm going to pray about is having that kind of dedication that I can wait for the long things to happen, the promises of God throughout my life, that even if I don't see them when I hope to see them, knowing that I will someday see them. And what I'm going to share with everybody is that this message of Jesus, that his kingdom that he is setting up, his mercy and forgiveness is for the Gentiles and for the people of Israel. This is for all people, as Simeon said. All right, everyone, thanks so much for listening. I appreciate you listening. Please remember, you can always email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. I'd love to hear what's going on with you and what kind of prayer requests or what your thoughts are about various chapters we read. Also remember, a better life in smallsteps.com is the blog. Brand new article up there about some of our bird adventuring because right now it's migration season. So if you have a few moments, you can take a look at it. We try to make sure that we don't post often, but we use your time with great value and respect. Mm-hmm.